nothing good that we've done that could worthy us to go to heaven. I'm not trying to get ahead of the preacher. I just heard this song just stirred my soul today. <coughs> Had it not been for the old preacher problem. Every, every one of us sitting in this room, one would not have any other. But because that old preacher problem we do. Now, we go going to turn the service over. Dr. M. Randall Jones. Been in this community now for probably 30 plus years. Pastor the church down here, Langston Baptist Church. May I say as a fellow pastor that this county is a different as a result of this man's commitment to God's service. I drove by him when he was his uh, flock would be standing at the corner of Conway the Interstice. They'd be praying for that town called Conway, South Carolina, and this county called Old in our state, and our nation, our world. Openly praying that God would put His hand on us. This has happened years ago. A great man of God. Brother Andrew, come on. God bless you, brother. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs>
uh, what will be actually a second uh, part of that book on how prayer changes me. The first book of the book is Teach Us to Pray, but uh, now I'm moving through how prayer changes me. And I'm going to tell you, if it don't change you, that it's, uh, you didn't get anything when you prayed. Amen. Oh, okay. Amen. Oh. Now, I heard all of the requests from the sick, and I don't minimize that, but I want you to do something for me. I want you to think now, uh, intently, just for a few seconds, about somebody you know who is not sick. Now, you know everybody that's sick, but how many do you know who are not saved? Think and ask yourself, if I know people who aren't saved, am I praying for them? And thirdly, am I concerned enough about them that I'd be willing to name their name out loud in church? Now think just for a few seconds. Have you got somebody in your mind? Maybe you've got somebody else that you're aware of who used to be in church on fire for God, but they backslid and out in the world today. We can usually find them quicker than we can the lost. Now that you've got that in your mind, and nobody's going to be listening to you because they're going to be listening to themselves. I want you to, in unison, on my account, give me the name of one person that you're aware of that you just won't tell God about by mentioning that name yes. so that we might pray and that God will move in their lives and that this week, this week, they get right in love. Got their name in your mind? Not thinking about anything else, just that name? On the count of three, I want you then just to speak that name out loud. Not ashamed, but out loud. Alright? Count of one, two, and three. Well, God heard every one of words. Did you know that? He's not, he, he's not messed up when a whole lot of requests come in at the same time. And he's got them all locked down. Now, what I want you to do is, beginning now, I want you to start praying for that person. And then before tonight's <coughs> service, I want you to contact that person and ask them to be your guest in church here tonight. What time is church? Six o'clock. Oh, most everybody, including the pastor, knows. All right, six o'clock. Ask them to be your guest. You say, well, they may not be able to come tonight. Well, that's okay. We've got service tomorrow night if Jesus don't come back. Now, he may come back before then. Yeah. And that's the reason I want you to get them here tonight because... He says that we are to work while it is yet day. For night cometh when man and no man can work. So we've got to do what we can, while we can, and then can all we can. All right? Let's just get them here. Do everything you can to get them, uh, your friends and your neighbors and your relatives, uh, your fellow students, uh, get them here. Matter of fact, some of you ought to start praying for your teachers. You've got some teachers. And your life be a whole lot better if your yeah. teacher got saved. You'd be a better student if you got saved. And your, right. your teacher would be glad because you got saved. Amen. Amen. Now, one other quick act. On Thursday of this week, I am privileged to help conduct a conference on evangelism. Not an evangelism conference, a conference on evangelism. We will be sharing information that I trust will uh, not only enlighten, but will encourage and enthuse our people to get active in winning people for Jesus. Now, I'm pretty sure your pastor's coming, and I hope he's going to bring his wife with him. Uh, we're going to give them free lunch when they do come. We're going to start at 9 o'clock in the morning, go to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Dr. Ron Barker from our Baptist building in Columbia along with myself, uh, we'll be directing this meeting. We're going to have some special music. My son Chris is going to be singing. We're going to have some testimonies that you'll be thrilled to hear. And then uh, we're just going to pray that God's going to set us on fire. You see, we're losing our state. 
Yeah. Baptisms are the worst, listen to this, mm. although our population has doubled at least. We have the worst baptismal record that we've had in 50 years. Mm. Churches are drying up and churches are dying and churches are closing their doors. And we are letting people don't go to hell because we're not doing what we need to do. And I'm convinced, and the reason I'm asking lay people to come, the pastor can't do it by son. Amen. And we've got to uh, get our folks involved. So if you can come, all I need you to do is call Langston Church and tell them that you're going to be there so that we'll have enough food to feed those people. All right? Thank you so much. And thank you for praying for me. And I ask for your continued prayer that God will keep me and fill my life and bless me and make me usable. I am under uh, commission from heaven. I can do nothing else than to keep going after souls. And uh, I, in this time in my life, I thank you, Pastor, for what you said. Because I see a lot of people who say, you're old, you're just enjoying. Hey, I am enjoying. Right. Right. I'm telling you now, when I'm preaching, I'm the happiest I ever can be. Right. And when I'm leading people to Jesus, I am just absolutely beside myself. Yeah. And I don't ever want to quit doing that. Right. Now then, open your Bible in the New Testament to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I want to bring a message today that's going to be so down to earth and so directly to the point that there's not a person here today will escape from standing and looking at the Word into the face of God Himself and hearing His Word as He speaks to you and to me. You see, the Bible is God's Word but we have relegated that to, uh, to just some book that we have. And we have developed our own opinion as to whether we're going to accept or reject it. And we say, well, I like this part, but I don't like this part. <laughs> hey, this is not something that you pick and choose. It's all God's Word. It is commanded for your life. And so we have to just say, if God said it, that settles it. Whether I like it or not. But I want to get to the place where I love it because it is God's Word for my life. And in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 5, I'm just going to read a couple of verses of Scripture in order to set the point for the message today. Verse 17. Uh, pardon me. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine. We talked about in our Sunday school lesson that today. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But, but, if you're an English student, you know that that means that what has been said is not a complete statement. There is more information coming that is going to finish what God had in mind. Be not drunk. Say, be not drunk. Be not drunk. Now that means don't be drunk. <laughs> Some people say, well, I can have a little bit. No, you can't. Come on. Yeah. The Bible says it's not for kings to put wine to their lips. Come on, come on. Hey, well, I'm not a king. I am. Come on, brother. For the book of Revelation, the Bible says that He hath redeemed us unto God and made us kings and priests unto our God. Praise what that so Lord? I could just hang out there, couldn't I? Oh, and preach for a long time. <laughs> and a lot of Baptists need to hear that. Amen. Come on. I know. I've seen you slipping around. But not you, but I've seen a bunch of other people in Conway. I won't talk about you. <laughs> Come on. Be not drunk with wine. Where it is excess, but what's his command? Be filled with the Spirit. Now, if one is a command, be not drunk, the other is a command. That's right. One is not a, a positive and the other a negative. These are both the Word of God pointing to your heart and to mine. Great. And the sad thing is, in our world today, we have allowed, God forgive us, we have allowed the Pentecostals, we have allowed the Charismatics, we have allowed some more fringe groups 
to rob Baptist of the understanding that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I didn't tell you to act foolish and jump pews and talk in tongues and, and do a lot of other things that people have thrown in saying that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to walk worthy Come of the things of God. You're going to keep Praise yourself him. only unto God. You're going to be like God. His Spirit is going to overflow from you. And everybody that sees you is going to know here is a person who is plugged into and turned on to God. Yeah. One of them accused me one time. He said, you're just a nut. I said, yes, sir. Well, but I'm screwed on to the right bolt. Amen. what God will have us be when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, let me move quick. In the book of Judges, in chapter 6 and verse 34, there is a, a man there who is introduced to us, and his name is Gideon. Now, we all know the story about Gideon, how God called him. He was a farmer. He was not a military man. God called him to lead the people in battle against their enemies. And uh, he finally submitted, did what God told him to do. Got a large army together, 32,000 people. And then God said, after he got it all done, God said, you've got too many. Yeah. Get rid of Tell everybody that's afraid to go home. Uh, he lost most of his army right now. Right. <laughs> I probably one of those that went home. I just have to confess to And then God said, you still got too many. And I'm sure Gideon must have said, now wait a minute, God, I've already lost 22,000. Here, I've got these left. And you're going to send some of them home too. God said, you've got too many. Bring them down to the water. And he reduced his army down to 300. God, have you seen that army that told the lady? Come on. Why, there's so many of them, they look like grasshoppers. Come on. Why, they've got so much more than we've got. There's no other way in the world. I can fight them with 10,000, but 300? Come on. God, I want you to know that when this battle is over, you're going to have to say, this is God's victory. Amen. Amen. And you know the rest of the story. He won, won mightily. God gave tremendous victory. Now, how did that happen? In that passage there, in the book of Judges, he says in verse 6, and our chapter 6 and verse 34, and the Spirit of the Lord, well, let me, I'm just going to quite quote it. Let me just turn that. I don't want you to miss anything. Judges chapter 6, he says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered unto him, and all the story goes. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. I was studying this the other week, and as I did, suddenly God said to me, you're missing the message. I said, so what do you mean, God? I'm reading it right here. What it says? So I began to study. Now, being a student of Scripture as a pastor, I also studied the original languages that it was written in. And I went back and began to look up in my Hebrew dictionary that word came upon. You know what that means? This is it. Come on. It says, God, get a hold of this, clothed himself with Gideon. Come on. It's like God just reached down and he picked Gideon up. Oh, really? uh, and he put Gideon on himself. Glory to God. Now, folks. When you see Gideon and his 300 men going to battle, what you're seeing is God showing out. Amen. God is showing the world what he can do with a handful of people Amen. that will yield themselves to him. Amen. Now, Amen. if that be true, and if now I find in the New Testament that God <laughs> says that same thing is to happen in my life, Come on. I am to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God is going to put me on. He says in that same book of Ephesians and also in the book of of Philippians, that we are to put off, take off the old man and what? Put on the new man. That means we're going to put God on us and so that where people see us, they're going to see God at work in our life. Wouldn't it be wonderful if tomorrow when you go to your job, somebody sees you and they say, you know, that's just the way I believe God would do that. I believe that's the way God would act in this situation. If if we're filled with the Spirit, 
small. That's the kind of thing that people are going to begin to say about us. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just uh, uh, back up the tab because I'm going to get ahead. No, I want everybody to come along and just say to you that there is salvation through the Holy Spirit. Amen. In John chapter 6 and verse 44, uh, the Bible says that uh, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. Amen. Have you ever been in a conviction? Come on. If you haven't been, you're not saved. I'll just tell you that. Amen. But if you know what conviction is, I mean, I've sat with you and thought there wasn't anybody else in the building except that loud, let alone preacher up there that was pointing his finger straight in my face. And, and I was just so uncomfortable, I couldn't hardly stand it. I was under conviction. The Spirit of God says what that man's saying is true. If he says in the Word, and, and what the Word of God was saying was just eat my lunch, I was just under conviction. And it was only when I got very God wanted me that I found the relief and the release that God wanted to perform in me. And salvation Amen. is through the Holy Spirit. Now, with that said, salvation is an act of God. Because, you see, your salvation was planned by God before the foundations of the earth were laid. He said it was in the mind of God that His Son would uh, be the sacrifice, that He would pay the price for your sins and for mine. It was purchased, while it was planned by God, it was purchased by the Lord Jesus and Christ. When He hung on Calvary, it was not an accident. It was not something that, that the Romans had thought of <coughs> uh, in a way to put Him to death. It was, uh, it, it was not the Jews. This is God at work. I want you to know that Jesus says that He came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. But He came to fulfill the mission that the Father had given Him and to pay the price. The price of a sinless sacrifice. And when He laid down, He said, No man takes my life from me. I give it myself. When He laid down, He said, Do your worst. Pin me to the tree. Nail me here. Hang me up in ridicule. And I still will show you that I am God and I will draw men unto me. Right. And so He purchased our salvation. Aren't you glad that Jesus taught you? Amen. Did you hear about the little boy who had uh, gotten him a, a boat kit? And he had worked in, and I'm sure with assistance, had built that, that uh, little sailboat. And he loved that boat so much. And he'd go down to the, to the lake near where he lived. And every day, he'd put that boat in, and he'd push it. And he'd get him a long stick. And he'd move that boat up and down, out and back. And that was his favorite toy. He enjoyed doing that for anything else that he did in his play. And as he's down there playing with it one day, a storm, sudden storm just came up. And it frightened him, lightning, thunder, and rain. And he ran home. And when he got home, his mother said, where's your book? I left it down there. And he started to run out. And mama said, you can't go out this storm. You can get it later. And so he went back the next day. And he hunted up and down the bank, all around the lake, but the boat was gone. And he was so sorry, so sad. And his mother, a few days later, came to town. And as he's walking along, there in a store with a pawn <coughs> shop, there was his boat. Well, excitedly, he ran inside and said, Mr., 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 I, my boat's in the weather. Can I have it, please? He said, your boat? He said, that's not your boat. That's my boat. He said, I own that boat. He said, this person brought it in here and pawned it. I paid for it. It belongs to me. You can't have it. He said, but, mister, that's my boat. I made it myself. That's my favorite toy. He said, that's my boat. He said, if you want it, you've got to pay for it. Well, how much is it? He told me. And the little boy was thanked because he had more money than he thought there was in the world. Well, he went back home and told mother what happened. And mom said, well, son, I'll tell you what. I'll help you. And uh, you do this chore and that chore, and I'm going to pay you a few pennies for everything that you do. And he got him jobs helping the neighbors raking leaves and, and uh, different things. And sure enough, he saved every penny. And the time came when he finally got the price. And with his treasure in hand, he went back to that store. And he walked in and said, Mr. I've come to get my boat. 
He said, son, I told you when you were here before, that's not your fault, that's my fault. He said, if you want it, you have to find it. He said, I've come to buy it. And he dumped all of his treasure out on the counter. And the man there counted them out, 10, 20, 20, 25, 30, 35, 45. And he said, all right, you've got the money. And he walked over, picked it up, handed it to that little boy. And with it in his hands, he walked out the door, beaming inside because he had his prize. And the store owner heard him say, You're mine, all mine. I made you, but I lost you. Lord. But I bought you back. Lord. And you're mine, all mine. Hey. The Bible says that Satan stole yes. the treasure of God yes. in the Garden of Eden. Yes. But it was in God's mind. And he came to this earth, clothed himself in the robes of Lord human God. flesh, and paid the price that I might be redeemed unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm talking now. The grandest news in the world is my sins are washed away. Amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe sin and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Salvation is an act of God. And it's presented to us by the Holy Spirit. But it is also an act of your own will. You see, folks, you can't be saved until you agree with God that you have sinned. And when you do, you what we call repent. It means to turn around. It means to go a different way. It's like you've been walking saying, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. But I stopped. I turn around. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Going in the opposite direction. It's a change of mind that produces a change in heart that results in a change of life. It's a totally new person that God produces in you when you open your life to Christ. Now trying to change your life without Jesus is like trying to score in baseball without touching first base. You may go all the way around, but you will not be counted in. You'll be counted out because you fail to touch first. And first is opening your life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. I receive you now is my Savior and Lord. Yes. It's the old song that we used to sing in the Baptist church. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. So we come and we say, Lord... I know you're working with me. I know you're speaking to me. I know that I need Christ. And so here today, as an act of my will, I submit my life to you. I trust Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Now, not only is there salvation in the Holy Spirit, but there is healing in the Holy Spirit. Yes. If I ask you, do you really believe that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, that's just about everybody. Right. And that's good because I'm telling you that the, my Savior is the same today yes, he as He was yesterday. Yes. And He shall be forever. Right. Now, please understand, friend. I believe in divine healing. Amen. I believe that, first of all, because God says that. But I believe that because I am a recipient. I have experienced it in my own life. Now, I've seen it in the lives of many others. I don't have time to belabor you and to give their testimony. But I just want to tell you that I thank God for divine healing. Some time ago, years ago now, I was in revival up in uh, Lincolnton, North Carolina, sitting out on my son's porch. And uh, that morning as I was studying the scripture, I, I realized that I had, a, I had a little pain in my neck. And I said, well, I must have slept on my neck wrong last night. I got a little crick in my neck. And so I got up and took some aspirin. Aspirin fixes everything. <laughs> and uh, it didn't quit hurt. We finished up the revival and it had constantly got worse and worse on the way home. My wife tried to massage my neck for me as I drove down uh, the highway coming back home. And uh, I'd take some Advil, and uh, that didn't seem to help. And I got home, and it didn't get better. 
Well, I was pastor of a, a large church when I retired from Langston. We got 3,400 plus members. And it takes a lot of doing to keep up with that many goats and sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to work. And so I did. As a matter of fact, at, at the peak, I guess, of all of that, I, I was taking, here this, 20 Advil a day. Now, I made a mistake one day. I had read the label. Yeah. It's amazing what you can learn if you just read what the manufacturer says. That's right. And I found out that I might have been dull in the pain, but I was killing my kidneys. I was going to die. I was going to drive my liver and all those times. I said, Lord, I can't do this. And about that time, somebody said, well, you ought to go to chiropractor. And so I did. Now, I want you to know that the definition for a chiropractor <laughs> is someone who is licensed to inflict pain and <coughs> charge and fall. <laughs> And that chiropractor did things to me that in the other days I'd fault them for hurting me. I, 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 it probably did help a little bit, but it didn't cure. And finally, I went to my medical doctor, who was a personal friend, and uh, after he examined me and uh, listened to my story and what had been going on, he said, Well, preacher, said, uh, I, I can't say anything until I can see what's going on in there. She gave me instructions. I went to the hospital. They did x rays. Uh, standing, they did x-ray bending, they did x-ray several other positions, and uh, they did an MRI on my neck. And then he said, uh, when you get those, I'm giving you the order, you just hand it to them, they'll hand them back to you and you bring them to me. Well, I didn't know what that would all meant, but I did what he said, and I got those. And I called him, told him that I had them, he said, well, I've already called the hospital in Florida, and uh, you've got an appointment with a neurosurgeon over there, and they're going to operate on you. I said, whoa, now, wait a minute. I, I wasn't in on that. I don't like doctors, much less those that cut you. I just don't like them. And I began to pray, God, you said in your word that anything that I ask, and you said that uh, you're the same today as you were yesterday. Well, you touch my name. And me and God talked. And my name went right over there. One Sunday morning, I started to the church. Between my house and the end of the street, it's just about a quarter of a mile, I believe. God said, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and it will be. I said, no, wait a minute, God. You know I've got faith. Did you ever argue with God? I said, God, you know I don't have faith. You know I practice my faith. You know I believe in divine healing. You know, dear God, that I fast as well as pray. And I've asked you if you hadn't healed. Just complain. I went on to church that morning. I did my early service. I taught Sunday school class. I did my 11 o'clock service. And I started home. And just as I pulled off the parking lot, God said, if you have faith, I said, no. God, we've been over this before. And you know I do. And my neck went on there. Well, I took some medicine after lunch, some Advil. And got me a nap, and as I started back to the church, it was that same story over and over to me and God. I came home, my practice in those days was that after I'd had a sandwich at night, I'd go to my upper room and I'd get in my study and I'd stay there till I was ready uh, to uh, start preparing my sermon for the next week and plan out the week and that kind of thing. So about two o'clock I went to bed. And the next morning when I got up, and I usually get up before my wife does, and uh, as I started, after having made a short pit stop, I started in the kitchen to get my breakfast to fix my coffee. And I, my wife woke, and I was standing there, just... She said, what are you doing? I said, it don't hurt. Praise 
it's still going to hurt. Glory. <laughs> Amen. I went back just for a regular checkup with my doctor. He said, what that surgeon tell you and what did he do? I said, I didn't go. He said, you didn't go. He said, I've seen the, the x-ray. You can't live without that. I said, no. God healed my neck. He said, healed it. I said, yeah, God healed it. He said, well, I've heard about stuff like that, but I've never known anybody had it. Let me shake your hand. I said, well, good enough. Let's get them together. Amen. By the way, I led my doctor to the Lord. Amen. Amen. But God is in the healing business. Now, I'm not just talking about physical healing. I want you to know that all of life is filled with God's intervention and God's blessings and God's power and Amen. God's might and God's miracles. And if we will just get to the place where we will allow God to move, He will move in our life. I had a lady call me not long ago, and as I talked to her, I had already been warned that she was going to call. Do you know how people that you warn other people about? I, 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 people had already warned me that she was going to call. And I honestly, I'll be honest, I didn't want to talk to her. I didn't have time just to listen to somebody complain about what they think about. But as she began to talk, I began to ask her questions, and, and she began to respond. And uh, she said, I have been a Christian many years, about five years. But she said, Preacher, hey, it's just not right in my life. She said, I am, I'm afraid I'm filled with fear. And I know that that's not right for Christian. Well, I began to ask more questions, pointed that. And in a little bit, God turned the light on in my head. And I said, ma'am, I just want to tell you that I, I'm convinced in my heart that uh, you are under demonic oppression. And I said, you may not understand that, but I explained just a little bit. And after I had, she said, that's exactly what's going on in my life. I said, well, would you let me pray for you? And there over the telephone, I said, in my rocking chair, and over the telephone, I began to pray for her. And man, by the time I finished praying, God had already given me the victory. And I said, dear, I'm just telling you now that God has touched and He has heard our prayers. And you're going to be relieved of this problem. Two weeks later, I was back in church there, where we go, I'm usually out on the road. And she was in the choir. And in our fellowship time, I went directly to her. I said, how is it? She said, preacher, it's the best it's ever been. Amen. And every time I see her now, she just says, it's still the best it's ever been. Right. My God is able to overcome yes. every problem that you have. But it's all only available by the indwelling, overflowing power of the Spirit of God who lives in the and when you come to understand, this is not just for the preacher. This is for everybody. Right. Yeah. It's the name of Jesus. I must hurry and I'll close. There is deliverance through the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 1 said, Let us lay aside every way and what? The sin that does so easily beset us. Lay aside every way. And you may be dealing with something in your life, some of the old things that you've got some way. And every time you come to church, the preacher gets to preach, you think, oh dear God, he knows all about it. And God puts his every time you get in the Bible, every time you kneel to pray, God puts his finger on that thing in your life that you know should not be there. I can see some of you now. You're thinking about that very thing that you've been holding on to. You know it's sin. You know that you need to be rid of it. You know that you've been holding on to it. You know that it's a weight around your ankle that's keeping you from being what God wants you to be. You know that it's in your life and Satan is using it to destroy you. And God's telling you that you need to get rid of that sin in your life. And you have quit again and again and again and ended up going right back to the same old thing because there's a willful disobedience in your heart. And God's telling you today, if you want the, if you want me to work in your life, you've got to bring that and nail it to the cross. You've got to put it out of your life, allow the Holy Spirit to crucify that. Now, how do we all do that? Number one, by acknowledging our sin. 
You have to admit it. Lord, whatever this is, it's wrong. <laughs> Secondly, by confessing our sin. Just saying, God, I know that this is sin, and you said it in your word that it is, and I'm uncomfortable with it here, and I confess that I'm guilty before you. And thirdly, then, by repenting. If you forgive me, God, I'm turning around, and I'm going to walk away from it. Now, I don't know what sin is in your life. It may be something as simple as gossip. You know, I've found most Baptist churches are alike. we got people in our churches that they're coming for so long. One fellow said, I've got women in my church. Their tongues are so long that they can lick the skin while it's in the kitchen while they sit in the living room. I mean, that's a long time. But we just about burned down the phone line. We got think we just can't wait to tell people uh, about what's going on, what we've seen or heard. Gossip. God, by the way, God does say that that's a deadly sin. A deadly sin. But then I Gossip. I heard about an old boy got saved. I think this brother over here reminded me of that this morning when he was giving his testimony about how he knew a man that used to be bad to drink, stay drunk, and all that kind of junk. Well, that's just the way this old boy was. Old George just got, he just lived that way. He just stayed drunk. Well, God got saved right there. And he got saved. Well, when he got saved, they brought him. He went to church. They accepted him in, baptized him. And uh, one of those old long-tongued women in the church, she began to tell all her friends, ain't nothing to do that. She said, I know it. Why, you just give him a few weeks, he'll be right back in that same old place. You just watch him. You just watch him. I'll tell you when it happens. You just watch him. Sure enough, she was coming by the beer truck one day, and there was his truck, old green Ford truck, parked right out there in front, where it used to be all the time. She said, I knew it, I knew it, just give a little while, he'd go right back to it. Well, it was Wednesday night, and she came to church, and she couldn't wait to tell everybody else in New York, I've seen George down to the beer truck today, you should have been there. George walked in, and he heard his name, and he said, what'd you say? She couldn't hide that. She had to just come out of She said, I saw your beer joint, your truck down the beer joint. I knew that you were in there. And I know what you was doing. You're doing the same thing that you've always done. You said you've been saved. You have been saved. You're just doing the same thing you've been doing all along. And I'm just telling everybody what it was. He said, I have been there trying to witness to those little boys that I had drunk with and God just convinced me that if God would save me, he'd save them. I am down there witnessing to them. She said, there's nothing to that. I know that. You're just going back to it, what you've always done. And I told them about the you You're just, your truck was down there, if your truck was out there, you were in there, and you were doing it. He said, you mean just because my truck was parked there that I'm guilty? She said, that's right. George went to work the next day. Didn't sell her to the old girl. George went to work the next day. And on his way home, at the end of the day, he pulled up in front of her house, rolled the windows up, got out, locked the door, and walked home. And left his truck parked outside her house. God has a way of taking care of it. And you better be careful for your
victorious living comes to us by the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Very simply stated, if you want God to work, and if you want Him to work in the life of this church, if you want Him to work in the life of your friends who know not Jesus, then you need to come to the heavenly God. That's right. Say, God, I'm giving myself up. I'm laying myself on your operating table. And you take everything out of me that's not pleasing to you. So that all is going to be left. You'll be what people will say. <laughs> that's what the just like. God. Hey. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Which of you right now is a preacher? God's called me to look at my life. And I know that there's some things in me that God's not pleased with. I want to fill you with spirit. Whatever there is that he's dealing with me about, I'm willing right now to ask God to remove it from me. I might be pleasing with you. You just lift up your hand and I'll see you and I'm going to pray with you. And I'm going to pray for you. I yes. want to be filled. I want yes. God to be my all in all. And yes. there. And another there. One there. And over here. And back yonder. Somebody else. There you go. Hand up. Come and just let God. There you go, son. God bless you. I, yes, sir. God bless you. Any other one? Now, that's me, preacher. I, amen, son. I see your hand. Thank God. You can put it down now. Anybody else? By an uplifted hand. That's me, preacher. I want all of God. I want Him to have all of me. I want to be filled yes. with His Spirit. And today, I'm willing to open my life and let Him do the examination and then the surgery that's needed. That you can fill me. But you just slip up your hand. Any other one? Any other one? God bless you, sir, and you, sir. Anyone else? Any other? Now, I wonder if there's somebody here that said, Preacher, I came here not knowing what to expect, but oh, I'm that one that's lost because I'm in my sin. I'm separated from God. If I died right now, I miss God, not miss heaven, not go to heaven. I will be saved. And I need prayer. Will you pray for me? Will you slip up your hand? Let me see you. Any other person here in the building? I'm not a Christian, but I desire to be you pray for me. Just slip up your hand. Let me see you. Anybody else? Oh, bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God loves you so much. Yes. I want to just pray a prayer. And uh, all of you share in this prayer. Simply this. Dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm undone without God. I know I'm lost. But Lord, I won't be saved. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. I believe that He was raised from the dead for my salvation. And right now, I ask You to wash me with His blood from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I pray that You'll set me free. I pray that You will come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And save me right now. I accept that I receive as my Savior. Now, if you pray that prayer as a lost person and you really meant it, you're inviting Christ into your life, I want you to just lift up your hand. Let me see you again. All right, there's one right there. Hallelujah. There's one that Satan can't have. There's another right there that Satan cannot have. But hallelujah. Praise God. There's another that the devil has lost and Jesus has gained them as a part of the family of God. Anybody else? Now, preacher, that's me. I prayed that prayer. I meant it in my heart. I've invited Christ in my life. You just lift up your hand. I want to see you. Three already have. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you let me be here today yes. and what you work in the life of these precious people. I ask you now, God, that you'll give them the courage and the grace to make their stand of faith for God. 
when the invitation is given, let them come down to the pastor and say, I made my from confession of faith, I've received Jesus, and I'm going to live for him all of my life. Yeah. And I just pray, God, that you will manifest yourself in this, these lives and the others as well. I pray for all of these who said, I want to get my life where God can fill me and use me. And so that others can see yes, Jesus yes, in me. And I just pray now that the Holy Ghost, heaven sent revival, is going to begin to be poured out on this congregation. And the brightest days that this church has ever known will be this day and the days just before us. May we see heaven come down and glory fill our souls. Yes. And we're going to praise you now. And we're going to shout and rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're standing together. We're saying 300 steps. 300.